discouraged. They were disheartened. They had, they had left everything to follow Jesus. They had left their faith, a lifelong faith. And when they left their faith, in many cases, they left their family. They were rejected. They were ostracized from their social circles. And, and they were just discouraged. They, they, had, they had counted the cost. Many of them lost their jobs because they followed Jesus. This is the way things were in the first century. When you grew up in a Jewish home that, that was following the Old Testament, a Jewish home that was awaiting the Messiah, but somehow when you came to this place where you met the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and followed him, you were rejected from those who were part of your family and your faith before if you were Jewish. And there were many people scattered around the world that were experiencing that, but they had met Jesus. They had the hope of Jesus and the love of Jesus and the joy of Jesus. But after a time with all the persecution going on, and all the, all the people in the Roman Empire and the people in the Jewish family that were sort of rejecting and pushing them out, many of those first century Christians were just feeling faint of heart. They were about ready to give up. Have you ever felt that way? Have, have you ever felt like, I'm following Jesus, I believe in him, I love him, but man, this is hard. There's so many things coming against me. That's what was happening. And what they needed was exactly what we need. What they needed is exactly what God gave them. They needed a vision of Jesus. Jesus Christ, God in human flesh. They needed a new, fresh vision of Jesus. And the book of Hebrews is that vision. If you right now today say, I, I need a fresh vision of Jesus, a fresh picture of who he is. If you've ever said to yourself, if I could just see Jesus and be in his presence and see his face, then I could fully surrender myself to him. Well, the book of Hebrews is that vision. It is this powerful picture of Jesus Christ, God with us. And so I want to tell you a little bit about this book of Hebrews. That This book tucked near the very end of our Bible. Tucked near the end of, of, of the New Testament. I mean, in my Bible, it's way back here. Look at all this that came before. It's this way back here in the back of the Bible. It's a book that oftentimes isn't read and even more often isn't understood. And part of the reason it's not read or understood is that it's a very unique book of the Bible. If you're a note taker, if you're a student of the Bible, I'd encourage you to write these four things down, these four unique things about the book of Hebrews because we're going to be spending quite a few weeks coming up, five weeks in the book of Hebrews. And so I want you to get kind of a setting of this book. So here's four unique things about the book of Hebrews. Number one, Hebrews is written with a unique expectation. The writer of Hebrews expects that the reader of Hebrews understands the Old Testament understands the ways of the Hebrews. It, it, it expects that we know who Moses is and who Melchizedek was and who Aaron, the first high priest, was. It expects that we understand the, the, the priestly system and the sacrificial system. There's a whole expectation that when you pick up the book of Hebrews and read it, you know the first two-thirds of the Bible, the Old Testament, because it's built on that. So if you know the Old Testament well, Hebrews makes more sense. If you don't know the Old Testament well and you're a Christian, get to know the Old Testament better. Because the New Testament and Jesus is the fulfillment of all that came before. A unique expectation. Second, a unique context. The time this was written was a time where Christians were being persecuted. And many of the early Christians had come from a Jewish background. So they had left their Jewish faith because it had been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. In many cases, they were rejected by their families. They lost their jobs. They, they, they were kind of pushed outside the social circles. And, and so in this time of, of now the Romans persecuting Christians also, some of the Christians were saying, well, maybe it'd be better to just kind of leave this Jesus thing behind and go back to where we were before in our Jewish faith. I mean, we know Jesus is the fulfillment of the Jewish faith, but maybe since, the, since there's not the same kind of persecution, since our families would then love us again, maybe it'd be easier just to kind of turn our backs and walk away from Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, no, no, no. Don't leave the fulfillment for what came before. Hold on to Jesus. So the unique context is a time of persecution where people were being tempted to walk away from their faith. Here's the third unique aspect. The book of Hebrews has a unique start, a unique beginning. 
in this whole section of the Bible where Hebrews falls, it doesn't begin with, here's a letter written by the Apostle Paul or by Peter or by John. There's no name. There's no author given. Hebrews just dives in with theology, Christology. What do we believe about Jesus? The start of Hebrews just goes right into belief and doesn't even bother saying who wrote it. It's just like, this is so important, let's get to Jesus. That's unique in the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews has a unique focus. It's what theologians would call radically Christocentric. It is centered on the person of Jesus Christ. Every verse, every page, every paragraph of Hebrews just drips with the truth of the person of Jesus Christ. And even when Hebrews seems like it's talking about something else, it starts talking about angels, what it's talking about angels for is to say, and Jesus is better than the angels. When it talks about Moses, you go, well, it's not talking about Jesus. But the whole point is, here's some things about Moses, but Jesus Christ is better. So even when Hebrews is talking about another aspect of the old ways, it's showing Jesus as the fulfillment and the absolute completion of what the hearts of God's people were waiting for and longing for. So the book of Hebrews is what I would call a contrast of betters. A contrast of betters. In other words, Moses was great, but Jesus is better. Aaron as a priest was great, but Jesus as the high priest is better. The Old Testament sacrifices, they had their place, they had a meaning, but Jesus is the final sacrifice. He's better. It's a comparison. Compare and contrast. And we do that all the time. We know what it's like to compare and contrast and to look at two things and say, clearly that one's better. I mean, th think for a moment about like a Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, imagine, picture in your mind, two Thanksgiving dinners. One that you throw in the microwave and heat up in three and a half minutes, and one that someone spent all day preparing. One of those two is better than the other. Sounds like a Sesame Street lesson, right? One of these two is better than the other. It's the homemade one that took time to make. Think about pets. Everyone thinks their pet is the best. Uh, you can decide which of these two puppy dogs you think qualifies as better. That'll be for you to decide in your own mind. Imagine somebody said, I can give you an old black and white TV or an 80-inch screen, beautiful, you know, the newest HD, whatever it's called, you know, you're going to pick the one that you think is better. Imagine on 4th of July, you have fireworks, and you can light a couple of sparklers and fountains, or you can see over Cinderella's castle at Disneyland, boom, the whole sky explodes. One is more beautiful and more magnificent. We can look and see what's better. Somebody says, I just planted a new tree in my yard. And you came over and you saw those two trees. One is better than the other. Somebody says, hey, you want some ice cream? Here's your two options. I'm picking the one that's not on the asphalt, right? And so are you. Well, when you read the book of Hebrews, you discover that Jesus is better than everything that came before. Jesus is the Messiah, the fulfillment of all that's come up to that point in history. All the books of the Old Testament are pointing to Jesus, pointing to the Messiah, and Jesus is the fulfillment, and Hebrews celebrates Jesus Christ as the fulfillment. I want to invite you to listen to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. I want you to notice all the theology that's packed into this short portion of the Bible. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets in many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he had provided purification for sins, he, Jesus, sat down at the right hand of majesty in heaven so that he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. I want to invite you to let this vivid picture, this vision of Jesus, sink deep in your soul. I mean, this passage, Hebrews chapter 1, paints this picture of Jesus that, that it's very similar to a passage like, and if you're a note-taker, write down uh, a passage like Philippians 2 or Colossians 1. 
There's these pictures of Jesus, Philippians 2, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, that just paint this poignant, beautiful, powerful vision of Jesus Christ. And understand, in the ancient world, when those people who had, who had left their faith to follow Jesus, who were discouraged, who had been rejected from their families, who maybe had been pushed out of their jobs, who were hurting and struggling, when they got this vision of Jesus, it lifted their spirits, and that's what it should do for you, and that's what it should do for me. In our times when we're struggling and hurting and saying, is this following Jesus, that this faith of Christianity, is it worth it? Read the book of Hebrews. And remember that he is better, superior, greater than all that came before. And this Jesus is ours through faith. It's amazing. Get the magnitude of these truths. I mean, in those first four verses, and if you have your Bible open or your Bible app open, look, look at those first four verses, all that's loaded in there. In those four verses, we learn this, that God spoke through the prophets in the past. This is a big deal, that God would speak to his people through the prophets, through, through Isaiah, through Jeremiah, through Malachi. God spoke through the prophets in powerful ways. But God spoke through Jesus with greater clarity and greater power. So God spoke before, but he's spoken now in a greater way. That Jesus is the heir of all things. What belongs to Jesus? Here's the answer. Everything, every person, everything on this planet, all the universe. He, he is the heir of all things. Jesus is the creator of all. That, that he is the one that the gospel of John says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and all things were made through him and without him, without Jesus, nothing was made that has been made. In Genesis, when God spoke, it was through Jesus Christ, the living word. This Jesus is the creator of all. Jesus is divine. Listen to these words from verse three of Hebrews one. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. That's Jesus. His radiance, his being, all fully contained in Jesus Christ. And then in the same passage, we learn that Jesus sustains all things. He sustains the universe. He sustains this planet we live on. He sustains your life and your strength. Every day of life that you and I have, Jesus sustains it in his power. That's the Jesus we're talking about. And then it says, after he made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty in heaven, that Jesus Christ is the one who makes purification for our sins. His death on the cross, his bearing our burdens, his taking our place, his cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All of that, the price he paid. He made purification for sins and then said, it's done, it's finished, it's paid. We see here that Jesus' work is final. It says he sat down at the right hand of the Father. The, the priests in, in the Old Testament temple area and in the tabernacle never sat down. With all the furnishings that are listed, there's never any listing of a couch or a chair because you never sat because the work was never done. There was always one more sacrifice, one more offering, one more thing that had to be done to remind the people of the depth of sin. But when Jesus came and made purification for sins, he sat down and said, it's finished, it's paid, it's complete. We learn here that Jesus is better than the angels. And back in the ancient world, even as in our world today, there can sometimes be this veneration of angels, this sort of people almost want to worship angels. When angels would show up in front of people through the Bible, some people would want to bow down to them and they, and they would say, you know, don't be afraid, but don't bow down. There's only one we bow to, and that's the living God revealed in Jesus Christ. And so all of this in these first four verses, you get a lot of the message of the Bible and the message of Jesus all put together in those first four verses of chapter one of the book of Hebrews. It's powerful. And so as we read Hebrews, there's, there's some lessons we learn, and then there's some ways we can kind of walk into living out our lives when we understand this, who Jesus is, and we get this vision, this picture of who Jesus is. And in Hebrews, it's clear that Jesus Christ is God with us. He is divine. He is God. That matters. That changes everything. So we learn in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 to 14, that Jesus is better than the angels. He is superior to the angels. If, if you think there's any comparison between angels and Jesus, it's not even close. And Hebrews is clear about this. Hebrews 1, 5 through 14, we'll just read the first two verses. You can go back and study the rest of the passage on your own. 
But listen to how it begins in verse five. Here's the question. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I become your father? To what angel did God ever say, you are my son, I'm your father? Here's the answer. None of them. None of them. They're created beings, and Jesus is the eternal son. So when you read this, you should say, none of them. Then it says, or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. To which angel did God say, I will be your father, you'll be my son? Here's the answer. None of them. Only Jesus. And again, when God brings his firstborn, Jesus Christ, into the world, he says, listen to this, let all God's angels worship Jesus, worship him. There is no comparison. And this is what Hebrews does again and again and again. As Hebrews says, Hebrews says, these great things from the Old Testament, from the Old Covenant, from the Old Ways, wonderful things, wonderful gifts, The reality of angels, praise God, angels, messengers that come from the throne room of heaven. But those angels, they bow down and worship Jesus. There's no comparison. He is better. He is superior. He is greater than. So here's a question. How can we make sure we never elevate any person or being to the level of Jesus? How do we make sure that Jesus Christ keeps his rightful place on the throne of our lives? And we don't bow down to anyone else. Here's some ideas. First, stay on your knees before Jesus. Keep yourself bowed down and worshiping Jesus Christ. In times of praise and worship, bow your knees. Submit yourself to him. And can I give you a good pastoral word of encouragement? If any human being ever comes to you and says, you need to bow down to me, get on your knees. You look at them with tenderness and with strength and you say, I bow my knees to one. His name is Jesus Christ. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. He gave his life for me. He made me his own. He rose from the dead. I bow to him. No, thank you. I will not be bowing my knees to anyone else. Every Christian should have that stance because, because we make sure that we don't elevate anyone above Jesus. We bow to him. Be sure that you worship often and fully. When you're gathered with God's people, whatever the music or style, worship Jesus. He deserves your praise. He is God with us. I believe it breaks the heart of God. When Christians spend time saying, well, you know, I really can't worship to that kind of music, to that kind of song. To those, you know, they, they have a certain style that doesn't work for them and a certain style they like. You know what? God deserves my praise and worship and your praise and worship, whatever the style of music. If you don't like the old hymns and you go to a church and they're singing the old hymns, you get into those words and you say, Jesus, I'm going to worship you. If you don't like the new praise music and you're a church that sings the new praise music and you're there, man, you worship Jesus, not because you like the music, but because you love Jesus. He deserves our worship. We bow down. How do we make sure we never elevate any person or being to the level of Jesus? We have to be honest in our own lives, when somebody is kind of rising up in our life and they're getting our attention, maybe a young person, a boyfriend or girlfriend is becoming more important to you than Jesus. And say, whoa, 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 slow it down. Only Jesus on the throne of my life. Maybe your boss at work says, you demand, I demand a level of allegiance that starts to come above God. You either lift Jesus up more or you bring that down. But you you make sure that Jesus is always above all people and all circumstances. And be honest when it's, it's getting out of line. And then remember this, that we are better. We are better people when we bow down to Jesus. I can tell you this. When I am am worshiping Jesus and following him and in his word and bow down before Jesus, I am a better husband than I would be if I'm not. When I am bowing down to Jesus, I'm a better dad. I'm a better grandpa. When I'm bowing down to Jesus, I'm a better pastor. I'm a better neighbor. I'm a better friend. When you bow to Jesus and you worship him as God, he makes you better in every part of your life. Let's continue on in the book of Hebrews. In chapter two, verses one through four, we learn this. Whatever you do, don't miss Jesus. I mean, whatever you do, we're warned, don't wander away. Don't don't, don't miss Jesus. Don't let your, your faith grow faint, but hold on to Jesus. Let's just look at that first verse in chapter two of Hebrews. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not 
drift away. Pay attention. Remember what you've learned. Why? So you don't slowly drift away. That was the concern in the first century is that some Christians were drifting from their faith because it was difficult to follow Jesus. And he says, just be careful you don't drift away. Just like in the ancient world, we have to be careful today. There's a lot going on in our world. There's a lot that is discouraging and disheartening. As, as, we, as we watch our, our state and our area open up a little, little bit, then close down again, and people are back to work and then pulled back out of work, and all, I mean, just all these challenges, as we, as we look at tensions between people, and as we watch media and watch all the conflict that's going on in our world, and we can just get, we can get weary and tired. And say, God, where are you? And Jesus, what's going on? And if we're not careful, and can I tell you as a pastor, I've had conversations with a number of people from Shoreline who've said, man, not being together in worship and not having Christians around me as much, I'm starting to kind of drift in my faith. And I talk with them and I pray with them and I encourage them to just hold to Jesus, just like the people did back in the days of the Hebrews, back in the first century, when there were struggles and pain and, 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 and disconnect. And yet God says, stay close to my son, Jesus Christ. Whatever you do, don't miss Jesus. So here's a question for you. What are some of the distractions and off-ramps we need to identify and avoid? As you're trying to follow Jesus, there's sort of these natural distractions and off-ramps, I believe, in many cases, maybe put there by Satan, or if they're not put there by Satan, they're leveraged and used by Satan. To get, our, to get us to drift away and not to focus on Jesus. I think that play, just our, whatever, whatever you do for fun to play is a great gift, but when we get too involved in it and it consumes our lives, we can drift away from Jesus. We're so busy playing that game, in that, into that sport, into that hobby, whatever it is, it, it just it causes us to drift away from Jesus. We're not reading the scriptures. We're not in fellowship. We're not with God's people. It kind of takes over, and Satan loves it. Be careful. When play is taking over and you drift from Jesus. Media. Media is powerful. And our brains are wired for the kind of entertainment that it gives. And it just feeds and feeds and feeds. And ask yourself, am I spending more time entertaining myself with media or more time meeting with Jesus? And what kind of person is that going to make me? And what kind of person, if I have kids someday, is that going to make my kids? If I'm this person all consumed in entertainment. Nothing wrong with media, nothing wrong with entertainment. Just make sure that, you're, that your involvement is in it doesn't cause you to drift away from Jesus. Sometimes people can cause us to drift. We get close to people, we build relationships, and they don't know and love and follow Jesus, and they start to influence us away from Jesus instead of us influencing them toward Jesus. Be careful. Even religion and church responsibilities can cause you to drift away from Jesus. I know pastors that are so busy doing the work of Jesus, they forget to sit at the feet of Jesus. And while serving Jesus, they actually start to drift away from him. We've got to be careful. And then certainly persecution and hard times. That's what was happening in the days that the book of Hebrews was inspired by the Holy Spirit, is there were persecution of Christians. And, and there's some, some pushback against Christians in our world today. I think it's going to grow in the next one, three, five, and ten years. I believe it. I'm not trying to be prophetic. I'm just watching trends. I think it's going to be tougher and tougher for Christians to say, this is what I believe and this is where I stand. And I believe it with, with graciousness and humility, but with absolute strength. I think Christians are going to get more and more pushback. Will we then drift away from what we believe or will we hold to Jesus Christ? The book of Hebrews, this vision of Jesus will draw you closer to him. Continue on with me in the book of Hebrews in chapter 2, verses 5 through 18. We learn here that Jesus is fully divine and fully human. That Jesus Christ embodied the fullness of divinity. We saw that in chapter 1, verse 3. But we also see that he was also human. And our minds can't fully comprehend this, but the Bible teaches it. So look with me at Hebrews 2, verse 14 and 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, Jesus, he too shared in their humanity. He became one of us so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who have all their lives were held in slavery to their fear of death. If you look at that and you really think about it, you understand that, that Jesus Christ came in human form, in flesh, so that he could give himself for us and lead us home to heaven. So, so we've got to embrace the fact that Jesus was fully divine, he, you know, that, that, that he was absolutely God, but he was God in human flesh. 
And our minds can't fully comprehend that, but God's divinity and God's humanity wrapped together in one person is Jesus Christ. Fully divine, fully human. So here's the question. What consequences, theological and practical, would we face if we deny either Jesus' divinity, that he's God, or his humanity, he was fully man? If we deny that he was divine, if we say Jesus was not fully divine, we really reject our salvation. Because our salvation can come because Jesus, who was fully God, could pay the price that we owed to an infinite God. He's the only infinite sacrifice. God himself gave himself for us. If we say he's not God, his, his sacrifice on the cross doesn't fully pay the price. And if we also, if we, if we reject his, his divinity, we also would say he's really not worthy of worship. If you worship Jesus and he's not God, you're worshiping a false God. But he is God, fully God with us. But also what happens kind of the other side of the coin, what if we reject his humanity? If we say Jesus really wasn't a person. And there's been, diff there's been different heresies through history that said, well, Jesus just appeared to be a person, but he wasn't. One of those heresies said that when Jesus walked on this earth, he left no footprints. In other words, he always kind of walked about a half an inch above the ground. He was divine, but not human enough to imprint the ground he walked on. He wasn't really enfleshed. If we say that, then we really reject the fact that he can be the substitution and payment for our sins. He died in our place for our sins because he was one of us. If he wasn't human, he could not bear our shame and take our sin. Again, the, the, the belief that Jesus wasn't fully human rejects our salvation that comes through him. And so we have got to hold to Jesus Christ and say, Jesus, you are fully God, fully man, wrapped together, and we embrace that. And, and so, so this, this then would lead us to look and say, okay, so if, if this is all true, if Jesus is better than the angels, if Jesus is, is God in human flesh, if this is all true, what does it mean for our lives? Well, each week in this series, we're going to look at kind of four implications. What does it mean in terms of how we worship? What does it mean in terms of how we surrender to God, to Jesus Christ? What does it mean as, as we walk with him as disciples? And what does it mean as, as we share our faith with the world? So let's just think about those as, as we kind of close our time together in this, in this beginning of this series on Hebrews. First, because Jesus is God, because he's fully divine, we worship with unrestrained passion. We don't hold back. With passion, we worship Jesus. When you're alone, I want to encourage you, sometime when you're alone, if you can physically do it, get on your knees or flat on your face and lay before God and say, God, I surrender everything to you. I worship you. I bow down. When you're with God's people, worship with passion. Don't give God half-hearted worship. Even if you're wearing a mask, worship God. Lift him up. Even if we have to be six feet apart, man, when we gather for worship, glorify him. If you're, if you're at home worshiping and you say, I'm by myself or with my family, but it's a small group of people or I'm alone, still give God everything you have. If you're at home right now and you're alone and you're online watching this service, first of all, praise God, you are part of his family and you're part of a bigger community than you can imagine or know. But you know what? Join in worship because God deserves it. And then as you're out in the world, let your worship flow from your heart. Shine the light of Jesus. I'm not saying you walk into the workplace and, and you say, hey, everybody, listen, I'm going to sing a, a worship song. I'm not talking about that. But man, let your life be just that kind of life that shows that you bow down to, you worship Jesus, and you surrender to nobody else. And then second, because, God, because Jesus is God, we surrender to his will over our desires. Because he's God, and I, I talked about this last week, in our last week in the series on the book, you know, if, if God's truth says one thing and my personal convictions or feelings or desires bump against the word of God, I will surrender to God's word every time. And we gotta be careful because we start to kind of creep back up and sort of start to, oh, I'm gonna do it my way. But man, when, when, when God's word and our lives come into conflict, we yield to the word of God and surrender to him. We surrender his will over our desires. And so I wanna challenge you any time you sense that what you want, what you desire, or what you decide you want to believe is in conflict with God's word, you grapple with it and you say, God, what does it look like to yield to you, to surrender to you, and to follow your will? And just watch how he leads you. And then, because Jesus is God, 
we will confidently follow his spirit's leading in the flow of every day. That's called being a disciple. A disciple follows Jesus, led by the Holy Spirit of God. And so as you walk through your day, say, I want to ex extend compassion to other people. Why? Because Jesus was always looking for where he could extend compassion. I'm not by nature a compassionate person. I'm very analytical. It's just my, my, my knee-jerk response is not compassion. It, it, it's something else. <laughs> and I want to challenge you because I, this is a challenge for me. Man, as I walk through my days, I'm saying, Lord, give me the compassionate heart of Jesus. Give me his gentle spirit. Jesus served. He wasn't quick to say, you serve me. He was quick to serve others. Be like Jesus. That's discipleship. Serve others. Who can you serve in your home, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in this time of need where people are hurting and struggling? How can you serve and show the light of Jesus? And then Jesus, his view of scripture was to be immersed in it, to know it. If you want to be more like Jesus and you want to be more of a disciple and you say, Jesus, you are God and you love the word, help me love the word. I want to challenge you to read the book of Hebrews. Read through the whole thing. Try, try one time to read it in one setting. Actually, just sit down and say, I'm going to block out like an hour, hour and a half. And I want to imagine it's the first century and I've left my Jewish faith and I've been rejected by my family. And maybe I lost my job because, because my new stance for Christ caused people to push me out. And I'm struggling and I'm hurting. And, and now there's persecution by the Roman government. And it's a difficult time. And I need to be reminded of who Jesus is. And then God gives this vision. Then you read the book of Hebrews with that in mind. Man, it will lift your spirits. And what you'll probably say is, boy, when I go through hard times, this book will remind me who Jesus is. And I want to hold to him. And then finally, because Jesus is God, we let the world know that God has come near and we do it in organic ways. We don't jump down people's throats. We don't force things on them. But we let the world know that God Almighty has entered human history. His name is Jesus. And he has changed our lives. He has transformed us. As you go through your days, let the light of Jesus shine through you. Let the light shine. Let, let your hands serve. Let your heart love. Let your mind be devoted to praying for the people around you to know the love of Jesus and let your mouth and your voice be ready to speak and tell people about Jesus. You say, well, I, I'm not good at telling people about Jesus. Well, how about this? Tell stories. Even the most quiet person, even the most shy person, they can tell a story. Tell someone a story about the presence of Jesus, how he comforted you in a time of need. And tell that story of his presence. Boy, Jesus was with me and here's how he cared for me. Tell the story of his protection. Man, this started to happen, and I was in big trouble. And you know what? I believe with all my heart, God delivered me. God protected me. God saved my life. Tell that story. It's powerful. And tell stories of God's power. I would have never made it through that if Jesus wasn't with me. We all have those stories to tell. When we understand who Jesus is, better than angels, better than everything, God with us. We have a story to tell to the world. So I want to invite you to read this book of Hebrews in our daily readings that are on the website and on your app. You can kind of follow along there or read the whole book of Hebrews in one sitting, like I said before, and just see what God speaks to your heart. And say, God, help me see that Jesus Christ is better. Better than what? Better than everything. Jesus, that's our prayer. Reveal to us who you are in a deeper, richer way. Jesus, you are better, superior to, more glorious than all that's come before and all that is now and all that will ever be. Jesus, you are Emmanuel, God with us. Help us to worship you and celebrate you and walk with you. We pray this, Jesus, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Well, before I give you a word of blessing, I want to invite you to interact with us a little bit. If you want prayer, you're going to see a number right there on your screen. Call that number. And please, if you have a need or a joy or someone you love is hurting, please do us the honor of calling that number and connecting with one of our prayer people. And we want to pray with you and just lift you up and, and, and encourage you. If, if you are new to Shoreline, you just text the word welcome to that same number. And we'll have somebody contact you and get back with you. If you want some information about Shoreline, you can go on our website and go to info at Shoreline Church or you can go to that number and say, I want some information. But, but just get a hold of us. Let us know how we can walk with you, and especially if you're new. We want to give you a special welcome. 
We're so glad you're here with us. We're going to continue worshiping Sunday mornings online at 8.30, 10, and 11.30. We're also going to, I'm going to be giving you a, a once a week Wednesday devotional by video. And every other week, I'm going to be uh, writing a letter to the congregation, just kind of sharing what's going on. We want to make sure you know what's happening in the life of your church. Thank you for joining us for worship. I encourage you to join us next week and invite a friend to join you, whether it's in your home or whether it's contacting them and having them watch on TV. Or also we have services at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock here on campus in the courtyard. Now receive God's blessing. As we close our time together, may Jesus Christ, God with us, the one who is better than angels, better than anything and everything, may he fill you May you overflow with his love and may you shine his light wherever you go for the glory of Jesus. Amen.